Okay. We good? So let's talk about this diversity thing. We're talking about, we want to keep this into the context of the old style person. Um, and some people say that we don't have a lot of bloodlines. Some people say that, and, and to the fact that it goes back to basically three horses is something, but that was a hundred years ago and, and, and change. Um, Lynn, I'm going to call on you like I did before. Um, but one thing that you, you did post as a question is um, there's still plenty of diversity in our North American Persians. Why would we import bloodlines from the homeland? So do you do you want to expand on that? Or is that pretty self-explanatory? What you uh, I have traveled a lot in the last 40 years. <clears throat> Both up in Canada and across the U.S. and seen a lot of horses out on the fringes. There are, before AI got big, horses were bred in areas and people were able to keep a diversity of the bloodlines with that. And that stayed pretty good until the 90s. And the thing is, they are still out there. If you travel around, you can find them. There are contrary people out there who don't follow what you see in the maiden stream. And likewise, uh, in 89, I went to the Pertron Congress in France. On that trip, there's two different places I want to mention. One is Francois Chouinard. He was the first non aveline family member to be president. He was actually a nephew of Aveline's. If you go to an 89-90 draft horse journal, you might find a picture of our tour group in front of Schwenard's house with a big pair of gray horses. Those horses he had raised, they were five-year-old studs. They were 18 hands, 2,500 pounds, Built the way you want to see a draft horse built. They were headed for Germany to become logging horses. Is where they were headed. I mean, they were massive. They weren't that bad of horses. On another part of our trip over there, on a farm tour, we stopped at a place, a Mr. Fago. He was a small farmer. He had three gray perchin mares, an old mare and her two daughters. The daughters each had gray fillies. He had a stock cow herd, about a hundred acre farm. That's what he had. The thing is, one of the members on our tour group spent quite a bit of time trying to talk him out of those fillies to bring back to Canada. His horses would not have done well at all in the French shows. American shows, they would have had a chance here. He was a contrary thinker in France with his horses. And the gentleman trying to buy those horses was Reg Black, the black home Perchers. Reg wanted an outcross. He found it, they, the old guy would not sell the fillies. But the horses were there, that old mare, her two daughters and her two granddaughters. They were the type that you would like to see a lot of the people that are on this forum tonight, you would like those horses. The thing is, they were still being used on the farm. They weren't just standing in there for the meat row. They were still being used on the farm. And here in America, there are still people using horses. Minnesota is a great place up there. You can find some contrary thinkers up in Minnesota, Wisconsin. You go out to Dakotas, out west, you will find some. You got to look to find them. And they don't care what is going on in the Corn Belt states with the big horse shows. That's not their thing. Mm -hmm. If you made a concerted effort, I know Diane has done road trips on herself looking for horses, trying to match up things she's found, go find a horse out in the middle of nowhere to see what it actually looks like to go with a paper she found on the internet. They are there. 
but you got to go looking for them. You might find it, but it's not going to be easy. And while we're talking about types in our own way, I had a young a stallion I raised who was built about 17, 17 one hands. He raised a lot of good working type horses. A lot of people would say, oh, that's a nice size horse. That's a good working size horse. The only thing they didn't realize, he was the full brother to Pleasant View King. He just wasn't built like King was. Because people don't realize King, there were four brothers, four full brothers, seven full sisters in that family. And there are some, still some draft behind them. That's, there's only one left alive yet. All the rest of them are gone. But the thing is, you get out there in the hinterlands of our country, you might find something that'll surprise you. But it's going to take some fuel and wear and tear in your truck and car to find them. So they're out there, I think, but you've got to go looking. I, I don't disagree with you um, in the sense that, and I don't know if it's the internet that has helped, thank you, or hindered, and that a lot of people want to do a lot of looking, but they want to do it from the comfort of their easy chair. And there, when people are asking for, and I guess I can't, I can't, I can't begrudge them, but when they're saying, I want to see a video, I want to see the, I want to see the hip, I want to see them from the front, I want to see them from this. If you were getting the farmer's exchange in 1975, the only way you were going to see that you could correspond and they can take a picture of that and they can get the picture developed and they can send it back to you through the mail or you got in your vehicle and you did the tour. You looked at you looked at it. I will never forget as a 14 year old girl missing the first day of school <laughs> uh, doing a um, a uh, um, Labor Day tour of Holmes County. And seeing these horses that have captured my imagination for close to 40 years. And I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd be able to do that just by looking at a horse's picture or looking at, look at, looking at a video on the internet. There is something to be said for that. There's also something to be said for people don't want to be bothered with your mare. People don't want to be bothered with you driving in the driveway, um, expecting the moon and stars out of their mare and she's 100 miles a bad road and uh, is kicky as all heck. And you're concerned that she's going to bust up your stallion. There are people that have fantastically great horses um, that don't want to breed to outside mares. They want to breed to their three mares that they've got at home. And that's all that they want to do. They, they may sell a stallion at Waverly or they may sell it privately, but they don't want to get into that. They don't want to get into that whirlpool. They don't want to get on that merry-go-round. Some of them don't want to be members of the association, but they register their horses and some even don't care about that anymore. I agree with the idea about breeding outside mares in my 45 years or more of raising horses. There's sometimes I breed outside mares. Other times I get so fed up with dealing with people, I don't breed outside mares. I rather just be off on my little self, my own little world, not have to worry about all the headaches that come with it. And AI just multiplies the headaches. I know I was in Holmes County. I had stallions available to a stallion station. And man, it takes a lot of time, money, and effort to keep that thing rolling. And you really don't make any money unless you got something that's People want to breed 50, 60 or more mares to. It's not easy doing this. No, it isn't. It's a lot of money to put up with these breeding horses. So. Um, does anybody else have something that they'd like to um, interject when it comes to that, when it comes to the concept and philosophies around the Persian horse genetic diversity at large, um, but specifically about the older style, field ready, traditional style, however you want to 
refer to the horse? Does anyone else have something they'd like to interject? Uh, Michelle Marble here. Hi, Michelle. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I, I'm kind of new into the Percheron Breed Association. So, but I'm coming from having bred and having had stallions and other breeds. Uh -huh and knowing how to do AI and things like that. But also, you know, having been in horses for, for 35 years, not as long as some of you guys, but um, as some of the associations have gotten around to recognizing that the foundation right. horses are, are super important. You know, the you American Quarter Horse days. Association has got, you know, foundation horse registry and now really promoting that. Uh, the, um, you know, uh, Saddlebred Association has finally come along and is doing something semi-similar. The Appaloosa Association has done it. The Walking Horse Association has done it. I'm sure that there are other breed registries that are working on that as well. The Arabian horses are, are looking at trying to get back to a more utilitarian sport horse. So they have, you know, a venue for that. Is there any way of working within the association to try to get this to be more friendly to a group of us who want to have more old style Bertrands? Well, let's let's uh, ask this. If you are a member of the board of directors of the Persian Horse Association of America, can you please unmute yourself and say who you are and where you're from? Exactly. Oh, nobody there. Nobody, well, nobody showed up. Not anymore. I, no. Yeah. No, to be and, fair, to be fair, I will say that Ann Clary showed up at our first meeting last month. Okay. I don't think you were able to be on that call, were you? Michelle? I was no, I wasn't no. personally. I had okay. had wanted to. So I I, okay. I made a big effort, hopefully, to try to be here tonight. But I, I, you know, you guys know about the Walking Horse Association. I mean, it's just, it's just horribly abusive, but I mean, it's taken us 20 years, but a grassroots organization was finally able to, to, to start making a difference. I'm assuming that's what you're trying to do now is, is make a difference. What we're do, trying to do is make a difference for the horse. Um, some of us are members of the Persian Horse Association of America. Some of us have horses that are registered in the Persian Horse Association of America. Um, that is uh, one of, well, I think it is the oldest draft horse registration association in America. Uh, yeah. And they've done some wonderful things. I think that the integration of the crossbred registry is a wonderful step forward. Um, I don't know how they're integrating the crossbreds into the, um, the shows, the national show or the Congress. I have not heard anything about that, but um, that's up to them. This, this tonight is something that's not necessarily disconnected with the Pershing Association um, because we are members and our horses are registered through, through the Pershing Association. But um, like I said, there's, there's no one here to speak for the association. Uh, tonight, at least. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know what they're doing as far as that is concerned. But, you know, uh, someone spoke about a breed standard, the need for a breed standard. There is a breed standard in, in France and how important that is. And, and France understood that there needed to be two types. Um, there's the more carriage type, which is a, a lighter horse. And then there's the heavier horse that would be more of your, your draft, <laughs> your plow horse. They understood that there was this need and they have in their classes that there is a differentiation uh, when it comes to the different um, classes that a horse can enter into. That is something that you don't see at this point at the national level, um, person, the National Person Show or the Congress up to this point. Not to say that that's not going to be but I have not heard, I've not heard, nor am I privy to that information. So they're not going to necessarily call me up and say, hey, Sarah, guess what you're doing? So I don't know that that's going to be happening. Um, but that sounds like something that would be a, a really, a really wonderful step forward in inclusion. Um, if, if the, if the crossbreds are going to be in, in the shows, let's, let's have some other shows. I, uh, hold on a second. Okay. So, 
um, since you're here, <laughs> Michelle, um, you had posted a couple times regarding uh, the forgotten colors of Chestnut and Bay. Um, you had mentioned that a couple times, uh, part of the, the Persian history. Um, I think without a shadow of a doubt, Diane is, is, has, Diane and her family have spearheaded um, the, Diane Blanzy, if you don't know her, uh, have, have spearheaded that <laughs> insurgence, that revival of the, of the persons of color. Um, so she's a, a wonderful point person to, to go to when it comes to those horses. Keeping in mind that tonight with the context uh, is about the old style, um, I think that it would be pretty much everyone's consensus that there is no wrong color to a good horse. I do know in France, uh, and that's why I think it's really important for you to, to watch the, the YouTube video uh, from the interview with, with uh, uh, Virginia, color other than black or gray is an absolute no-no, absolute no-no. Blue Roan is a little bit uh, squeaky possibly because it can have those dark points. Uh, but when it comes to chestnut, bay, sorrel, absolutely a no-no. They will be in, there's a, na a, a, a national directory, sorry, I have caps, a national directory that is above the stud book that will show the horse, uh, will, will show the horse's pedigree so that you know the horse is of pure-blooded ancestry but that horse will not be licensed to breed. So if you are passionate about the full-blooded Persian chestnut, um, I can't speak for either association. I can't speak for the French Society, nor can I speak for the um, uh, Persian Horse Association of America, but that's a full-blooded horse. If you reach out to her, and, and we're not talking that they have they have five or 10 every year. It's, it's, it's very sporadic, but there's a possibility if you wanna import that horse, that that horse could be registered. So, uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, yeah. Mr. Sharon, can, can I ask a question? Can I say something? It, yes, it's a little please. off topic, but for me, when we talk about, you know, reestablishing or establishing the old style uh, of Percheron, I think that we all collectively, if we wanted to, could really learn a lot from Diane and what she did for color. Absolutely. Because, you know, for except for the past few years, I mean, Diane's been a champion for a long time. That wasn't something that was as common as she has really made it out to be with the investment of her time and her effort. And I think that you could apply some of the things that she's done mm -hmm. for color to the old style without you know having to go as far as a breed standard which for me is a little bit scary right now because if you were to implement a breed standard right now it would be a hitch breed standard i absolutely agree with you when it comes to that standard as much as i would like to see it um i i think that it, right now it's a scary proposition um because i just I, I hate to be a debbie downer but i know what it would look like and it would be really disappointing and disillusioning for a lot of people so I'd rather keep it entirely open right now. Um, the challenging thing from my experience and Denny's is that there were a lot, there were a healthy amount of these, these other colored purebred Persian horses for whatever reason, um, not a lot. I mean, not not to the point of gray, because gray. There was a time that gray outnumbered blacks, and even in publications, a black was considered a, a less than desirable Persian horse. Gray was it, um, but and in America as well. But for um, for whatever reason, I think it, a lot of it has to do with a bunch of PT Barnuming. To be honest with you, it's a little a lot of. Uh, um, circus carnival barking the groans and the chestnuts the bays what have you were meant they were considered to be less than and um they fell off 
they fell off, whether they were culled or whether they just weren't bred or they weren't registered. Um, I think that it's a lot of a human human error and it's really unfortunate that a lot of those lines were lost never just that once you once it's gone it's not coming back so it's really unfortunate um, Sarah can I say something about the gray horses for the circus yeah they the grays were most popular because they were a lighter color they didn't overheat but they were easier to match than say some of the others and one of the last 40 horse hitches was a team of bays that were driven by two gentlemen on the, the winter grounds, I think, of uh, Barnum and Bailey. I, I would have to look that up, go and research it. But I do know that that was one of the last 40 horse hitches driven. It was driven by two men and until Dick Sparrow came in and did it with the Belgians. And of course, mm -hmm. at that point, the Belgians, they were easy enough to match. But back then when circuses were, you know, the thing where they traveled either by road or on the trains, the grays were easier to match and were easier to keep cool as they did their work. So that's the reason why you saw the grays a lot more. Mm -hmm. It was the preferred color for the practicality. And I've heard some old stories of the, there was uh, some sort of adhesive that they would put on their back so that the acrobats could, could have their feet not slip off. And it was uh, easier to be hidden on a gray horse than a black horse. I have a zero knowledge that that is a fact, but I think that's some folklore. So in the comments, uh, Anne Cleary, Lori Hammersbach, and Lori Bolden are trying to engage the Pursuit Education Fund in a farm type clinic in the Midwest. I think that that's fantastic. Um, Anne Cleary and Lori Hammersbach and Lori Bolden are also very proactive when it comes to youth clinics as well um and i my i tip my hat i tip my hat to you um anyone else have something to say i'm ready sarah i'm ready <laughs> so this is diane sure. for people who don't realize i have to use my phone so i have two um entries on here um i wanted to touch base a little bit on the color history real quick um, I have spoke with Virginia a couple of different times. Um, sh she may not necessarily know exactly when, and granted, I haven't watched the YouTube video you're speaking of yet, so maybe she touches base on this, but one of my biggest questions that I've always had is at what point did France change their breed standard to no longer include anything but black or gray? If people dig through the historical books, if you dig through the old stud books, you will see a lot of colored horses were imported to both Canada and the United States from France. So the color existed over there already before it even got here. Um, we didn't have a definitive answer and I've never gotten a definitive answer on to when it changed or why it changed. Um, I speculate a few things and it's nothing bad. Um, but I can see why maybe they went to just black and gray. Again, there has always been lower numbers. They're not as common. Gray dominated massively in the early years of the perch run here in the United States and Canada. Um, but now we see a major difference of where black is taking over and gray is almost disappearing. Um, I compiled a few numbers here within the last two years of all foals registered with the Perch Run Horse Association of America. and it's looking pretty sad for the grays. There were less than 200, if I remember correctly, grays registered the previous year, as opposed to 800 black foals. That's a pretty big, massive difference. So I definitely think for those of you who own grays, you might wanna hang on to those little treasure troves. Um, but as far as the color goes, it's always been here. Um, it's been around, but it's always been a minority. And I think, as you have said, with the um, advancement of our ability to use the internet, um, it has really broadened the horizon to be able to show people that yes, there are Pertrons other than black and gray and to be able to reach a much broader audience. So that was what I had to say. <laughs> I was gonna go get myself a pen. So I took the video up and you're like, okay. <laughs> Well, I will do that in a minute then. 
Um, I'm just going over these. I've got I've got two pages of questions here. Um, so I want to make sure. And and I have to say this, and I hope you can indulge me. I, I need to keep my moderator host hat on, but I'm also a breeder. So I'm I'm having to juggle those things and, and um I don't wanna I don't want to monopolize the conversation either. Here's something I find fascinating. Unfortunately, the person who uh, wrote this question isn't on the call, but I think this is important. Um, if you want to save the old style breed, why are the stud fees so high? Would someone like to go first? Um, I don't think 500 bucks is really that high, but okay. <laughs> to say I, I don't I, I I it's can gross I have I have two grays I have an old style and I have a hitch style Val and Roxy and I have um some of you have seen my little cross uh duchess um my little gray filly and I mean I I bred Val for four seasons before she finally caught and that stud fee was 1500 bucks to a percher on or to a, a Barack Pinto so five and 500 is usually what I see from the breeders on our site, 500 is nothing. And even with, you know, a collection fee, if you're doing AI, a collection fee anywhere from 200 to 350 bucks, 350 is high, but most of you guys aren't charging anywhere near that. I, mm -hmm. uh, I and 500 bucks is not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why are breeds less? Why is it less to breed to a non-registered horse than it is to breed to a registered horse like i think diane you might be an example that could answer that like if i breed my percher on mare to your horse i pay a higher fee than if i were to breed a core horse to it is that right like is there it seems like there's a difference in that and i didn't i didn't understand that but i'm new to the breed just to clarify um i know you're talking about deuce deuce is not mine He's not oh. my stallion. Um, I'm going to be very honest with you. No, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to be very honest with you. He belongs to my sister, but I am 100% behind him. He was bred by my parents. My sister is the one that owns him and handles him, and I help kind of manage him a little bit. Um, but I can tell you one of the reasons, um, granted, I can't speak for her, and I may be wrong in this, so please don't hold me to it. And hopefully she doesn't hold me to it either if she sees this. But um, I thought that maybe part of the reason she had a difference in stud fees originally was is that at that time, um, the value in crossbreds, it's crazy right now. It is really crazy, and I never expected it to be like this. But the, we felt that the Pertron and the registered Pertron had more value and would bring more bang for its buck to the owner than what breeding crossbreds were. Now, granted, she has changed the stud fee recently, and it's even across the board. There's no just this for purebreds, just this for crossbreds, just to clarify. Um, but again, I can't speak for her specifically. Maybe sometime I'll ask her, and I can always write you, Sharon, and, and give you her reasoning as well privately if you would like. Just, okay. just to know. I, she won't, I don't think she'll be offended if I ask her. I just want to say... I wasn't trying to be offensive. I was just trying to understand. Well, I just wanted to say something about the higher fee for the purebreds. When I bred a Percheron mare to a Andalusian stallion, I actually had a lower uh, fee because it wasn't I wasn't breeding Andalusian to Andalusian. So the crossbreds or other breeds, because she she's not a cross the mare wasn't a crossbred, but to get a crossbred, it was a lower price, and it and it I think it still is. So it's not just Percherons, it, Andalusians, Lusitanos. In order to get a Spanish Norman, yeah, I, I paid a lower price than if it was an Andalusian to an Andalusian. Hmm. This is this is Michelle, and some of that has to do with paperwork. Uh, you know, a registered horse is going to take a little bit more time, paperwork to get done uh, and follow up than there is on non-papered. And and I know that from my years of breeding walking horses and quarter horses. I, 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 signing my name isn't going to take me more than five minutes. That's, that's, um, 
I'm not registering the horse. Doing doing a doing a uh, a stallion report, uh, doing an application. Uh, yeah, it, 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 that doesn't seem to take that much, at least for the Persian Association. I can't speak for the other ones, and I'm not going to. I do want to say this. I was a young girl when we got into registered horses. I was 10 and a half. We had had grades before, um, and I followed pedigree like you wouldn't believe. If the internet had been around, I'd, my rear end would be even wider because I'd been looking up pedigree on the internet. I really followed it. And as a young girl, I was very aware of what was going on when it came to who we were breeding to. In the early 80s, uh, it was a dot gray son, Shawhaven Pete, and his breeding fee was $250 in the early 80s. We are charging $400 for Dandy. When you figure the AI collection processing and shipping, shipping itself being $180 for overnight. I think that the difference between $250 40 years ago and $400 now, I really don't see that as causing somebody to grab their ankles. When in the dairy business in 1988, the Wetchins bought a truck for how much? And milk prices per hundred weight were the same then as they are right now. So if you've got a truck in 1988 that cost $16,000 that would be worth over $50,000 off the, off the lot, but milk prices are still the same, I am begrudging nobody on uh, recouping their expenses on, on owning a stallion and, and uh, having him either cover live mares live or shipping semen. It's, it, is, it is a process. Um, but I felt that it was important that we talk about it and have that recorded so people would get a better understanding. And when you look at horses at large, I don't see any, I, I think the largest I've seen is maybe a thousand or 1200 maybe. If somebody thinks, if somebody has seen a, a, a person for more money, I don't know it and you might all know of it, but I don't, I don't think that the prices are that much. That being said, in France, two to $300 is what the breeding fee is. Nothing, nothing by and large is done AI. It's all done live cover. They have a lot of stallions to choose from and they are spread pretty evenly throughout the country. Whereas we don't have that luxury of having an abundance of stallions um, west of the, uh, Mississippi necessarily, so there uh, there are some some differences there. But I did find find that interesting that it, the breeding fees were not very expensive. Um, Can I add one uh, Canadian perspective to that, quick, Sarah? Yes, please. Um, the from what we've seen so far, we're just getting into purebred, so we've always got whatever we could get a hold of, but we're now getting into registered Pertrons. Um, and I agree for the most part, $500 is the average stud fee that we've seen so far. Whereas for quarter horses and paints, its average is a thousand and up in Western yeah. Canada. So $500 is not expensive. <laughs> yeah, Again. Jamie, I was going to say the same thing. I, I volunteer at a breeding facility, and most of those that you know between the Tennessee walking horses and the quarter horses and the Arabs, their their average is about three thousand dollars. And granted, they're breeding to, you know, some of them are upwards of twenty five grand. So when I paid my my fifteen hundred bucks, I wasn't complaining too uh, too much. Um, does anybody else have something that they want to interject on that? Well, I would like to. Can you hear me? Sure can. No, it's Jane. Yes, please go ahead. We can hear you. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, James. Please go ahead. Um, I live down here. We can hear you, but you're gonna to have to speak up, okay? Uh, 
I think you might have been, were you using a headset or uh, earbuds maybe? Because now we can't hear you. You were unmuted. You're unmuted, James. Please. What's that old saying about technology? When it's good, it's very, very good. But when it's bad, it's horrid. Nobody was born knowing this stuff. So we're cool. So James, um, we're going to circle back, OK? Uh, but I do want to hear what you have to say. Um, OK. <laughs> <laughs> James, <laughs> I, I think it was somebody else, and I was trying to leave the space frame, and I'm unmuted at the same time. No, I think it was always you, James, because your name pops up large on the computer. So please go ahead. Oh no, that was somebody oh. else's. But I'll chime in. Um, compared to the thoroughbred stud fees around Lexington, Kentucky, a thousand dollars seems like pennies. That, that was all I would chime in with. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, the Wetchins charged 50 bucks. And I think that there are still some people, uh, Dave Siders um, in Northern Indiana, I think he's around 250. He's not gonna ship semen, but do live cover for that. You know, I'm, again, we're not gonna tell somebody how to spend their money. Mark, did you have something you wanted to say? I did. Okay, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. I live down here in Mississippi, and our stud fee down here is seventy-five to a hundred dollars. And that is a registered horse. Did you get that? Yes, and that's a registered person. Well, mainly grade, mainly, mainly grade. Yeah. 64 inches to 67 inches tall. They look pretty much purebred. They're black, white star, short, real big and stocky, but no paperwork because the Yoder family and the Gingrich family down here, they don't keep any paperwork. Right. Some of them can't. Some of the Amish churches uh, pockets around the country, uh, the bishops, the church leaders will not allow them to carry paperwork. Um, so it's it's part of their religious ideology. Um, and we just have to work around it accordingly. But you did have a question. I do have it down here. Where do I get my 64 inch, 1800 pound, 2018 grade black Persian mares bred? If you are, if, if they're grade and you're wanting a pure on working horse, and you find a stallion that is a hundred bucks, good work if you can get it, I'd say. I mean, if, if that's what you're going for, then I think that that's, that's fine. It, it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, but if you don't have that around there, um, then, then it's, it's fine what you're looking for. I do know of a stallion in, uh, Mississippi and shipping uh, live semen on him is a thousand dollars. They will do live cover. I don't know what their uh, fee is. I thought she was going to be on the call, but I don't see her. Maybe she is, and I just haven't seen it. Um, but, but yeah, if I mean, if 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 what you're looking for is a good farm team, and that's what you've got in your mares and that's what you're looking for in your foals and you can find a hundred dollar stallion that fits the bill i don't think anybody's going to begrudge you i wouldn't it really depends on on what it is you're looking for i was trying miss wilson i'm trying to find something that is registered so i can start getting into the registry and if the person who has that stallion wants to speak up, then she is more than welcome to. <laughs> uh, she, she, I, I'm uh, here. Yes, girl. Come on now. Lordy. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
I don't know what to say, but yeah, he's he's sixteen one. Um, I have not weighed him. So he's fifteen years old. His register name is Sir Lloyd. And no, baby, Papa's not here. Can you go watch your movie, please? Um, and his live cover is six hundred. So definitely, definitely not a hundred bucks. Sorry. <laughs> But that gives you some options, okay? That gives you some options. Um, if, if that's the direction that you want to go, uh, you two can can uh, message each other, or um, or connect with me, and I can get you in, and we'll try our best. Okay. So Kim is coming back in. Okay. Um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm going back is this on your mute phone because. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, what's, what's the last name? Why don't you just do the chat? Can you do the chat? My last folks? name. Sarah, can you connect us later, please? Yeah. Yeah, just send me a message All right. and, and we can Bye. do that. Little people, little people need to go night night. And so thank, their, thank them for their patience. Um, anybody else want to, want to chime in? Uh, I, I have something to say, but it's not really on stud fees or anything like that. It's more to the beginning of our conversation where we talked about finding the heavy draft horses. Okay. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a breeder. I am uh, a teamster. And I used to drive for a fellow in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. And he had a magnificent pair of... Uh, mares that were 18 hands high, 2,400 pounds. And I, I talked to him since the last talk that we had, the last meeting that we had, and he is grieving. He lost a couple of horses. He lost his wife this year and couldn't tell me if he had papers for him or not. But he said they came from Northern Alberta. And I'll look into that a little bit more to see if we can find uh, the breeder that he got those mares from. So just giving you a heads up where some of us are still looking. Miss Wilson, you're, you're, you're uh, on mute. Okay, um, I'm trying to get Leonard in, and I don't, I don't see you in the in the waiting room, guys. Yeah. Hi, Norm. Okay, you. I sent the text. Did you not get the text? Yeah, I sent Leonard the text because it's going to be a different link from the one last time. It's not going to be the same one. Okay, all right. That's right. Right. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Sorry about that. Technology. Sorry about that, folks. But Leonard is very important when it comes to old style Persians. If you don't know Leonard Kramer and Marie Brown, Marie Brown is the, uh, with her late husband, Dick Brown, were the ones that brought uh, Modoc Herbert into our consciousness. They would consistently advertise that horse in uh, the Persian news. And since uh, uh, Dick's passing, she and Leonard Kramer have partnered up and are very proactive when it comes to finding old style horses for people throughout the country. Um, Leonard doesn't do Facebook, but Marie does. So try to connect with Marie Brown. I don't know if she's on the call or not, but um, those are good people to know when it comes to uh, trying to find horses. So uh, thank you for your indulgence, but I didn't want to leave them in the lurch. So thank you for that. Um, Cindy, I see that you're uh, on the call. Thank you for being here, my dear. And I want to, uh, this is really important what Cindy wrote as a, as a question and comment um, when she registered. We middle-aged plus plus women trail riding our Persians still have an influence 
as we introduce the breed to an audience that is unfamiliar with drafts. My mare and I convinced three others to buy draft mares and many more to watch them at the state fair. I board my horse and that makes it prohibitive to have a team. I'd love to learn to drive a single, but how and where? So Cindy, thank you for that. I think that you are, uh, are you in Wisconsin, I think? Um, there, Wisconsin is uh, boasts a lot of really amazing Persian people, draft horse people and Persian people. So we can try to try to find somebody that can work work with you, work around that type of situation for you. But thank you for saying that. Um, I've I've been a little bit critical of um, trail riding. And part of that, let me explain, is because when I see in my group people coming in looking for horses, uh, or even as a, a person selling horses, I'll have people contact me and they'll say, do you have anything for sale? Yeah. What are the prices? And I'll say what they are. Well, we don't need papers. All we're going to do is trail ride. Okay. So that means all that, because all you're going to do is trail ride, that I should discount the price of my horse and I should forfeit uh, the registration of the horse because all you want to do is trail ride. Now, that's, that happens more than once. That happens a lot. So I'm not going to say that it doesn't. I'm not going to downplay it. But I do think that um, it is important and it is, a, it is part of the market. It's, it's the job. Um, Is the trail rider breeding their old style mare? If you have an old style mare, if you have a 16 to old style stocky milk mare, are you breeding her? Hey Leonard, I'm gonna mute you, but glad to see you, my friend. Okay. She can't hear you. What do I gotta do to hear? Oh yeah, I can hear you. I can no, hear you. you can't. Being on the call. So, so we're all good. We're all good. So, so what do we do with the horses that are in this old style style that are in barns and in possession of people who are not wanting to, to breed them, not wanting to perpetuate those bloodlines? Um, uh, again, not trying to tell somebody what to do with their money, but um, do we as sellers, what is, what is the responsibility that we have in perpetuating the old style in who we sell our horses to? Um, and Diane, God bless you. I'm gonna call on you specifically. Would you mind speaking on that in your perspective? Um, I'm not quite sure, but um, we'll, just use a lovely example here. I happen to have a filly available right now, and she is out of a 16 two hand percher on mare, the very first percher on mare I bred back in 2006. And she looks a lot like her mother. And people are going to be probably very attracted to that because she's not going to be very big. She's going to be in that 16 two, 16 three, maybe 17 hand range if she's lucky. And as I've gotten a lot of interest on her, the biggest thing is that it's hard for me because I would like to see her go somewhere where she is going to be utilized. I don't care if people want to trail ride. I don't care if they just want to kiss their nose. And I don't care if they want to drive or put them in a collar and work them. That's wonderful. But I also think it is wonderful that we help promote and encourage people to keep papers with the horses as well as to help continue to guide them after they have the horse. If they're interested in breeding, I more than welcome any questions from anybody, anytime, I don't care when, you can ask me 50 questions, you can ask me 100 questions, I will always try to help anybody. Um, but I think you have to really be conscientious and don't be afraid to talk to people and ask them, what are your intentions with this animal? What are you thinking of doing with this horse? Um, what exactly are you looking for? Because a lot of times people impulse buy. They go, oh, it's beautiful. I just want it. I got to have it. And then two months, six months, a year down the road, hey, Diane, I got to sell that horse I bought from you. Okay. 
Well, then I have to sit in front and worry about where that horse is going next. You know, are they going to be as proactive with going, I want to place this horse in the right home, or are they just going, I need to get it out of here and I need the money? Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm going to give an example. I had a mare that that happened to. She ended up amongst traders. And um, these are folks that are involved in other sides of the equine industry. Mm-hmm. And I was very concerned with where she was going to end up. And the people that had her thought I was crazy and being psychotic because I wanted to know if they had the mare and if she was okay. And I, I hadn't owned the mare in three years, but I just wanted to know that she was going to go somewhere good. As I've said, don't be afraid to ask questions of your buyers and to ask them what it is that they are looking at the horse for. Just, it's okay to speak up and ask those questions. You know, it's not just about, Hey, you're going to pay me the money. I'll take anybody. Just ask questions and talk to people. So that's my input. Yeah, I think Sarah, um, I, Val is 16 too, and she's, she's an old style. And I think like my baby is my baby and I wouldn't take a million dollars for Dutch, but I love the heavy style of the breed and I want to give back to that and breed her to another heavy percher on, but I'm, I'm, I, I, it, it wouldn't be something that I would keep. It would be something to perpetuate the breed and I'm scared to death of where that baby's gonna go. Well, um, we had a situation, if I may, now I'm gonna put my breeder hat on. Uh, this was before I moved up here. So Denny and I met each other through Marie, through the through old style Persians. Um, and then I moved up here, but just before I moved up here, he sold a horse to a person, a a group that had been breeding for a long time. And we thought it was going to be a wonderful situation. And they took a long yearling and put him in with a bunch of bitchy mares and um, called Denny and said, this horse won't, won't settle mares. He won't breed. Okay. Well, then we just, then we heard that he was going to be sold and we're like, you, I was freaking out a little bit because I knew that horse was going to be going to be cut. And that was going to be the end of that, that this, this bloodline, this, this style is, is too important to be just going to be gelding. Well, it turns out I was wrong. They bred that the other people bred the horse. They, they put some food on in his belly finally, and they let him grow up a little bit. And they were breeding so many mares that they wanted to buy his, his sire. They wanted to buy the dandy horse. They, they liked him so much. Um, it's really tough to, un, to have the balance between the follow-up and the letting go. Uh, we can't micromanage everybody's, yeah. everybody. we can't do that. But here's an interesting thing. So I've been kind of aggressive or assertive on promoting this stallion now that I'm up here and, and doing AI. I had a gentleman contact me, said, boy, I'd like to get a team of geldings looking like that horse. And at first I was a little bit mousy and a little bit timid, believe it or not. I know you're freaking out on that one, but I got to thinking, and during the conversation, I said, no, we're not gonna do that. We've actually got a waiting list of people who went stud colts uh, out of, or by this horse. And they're looking for, uh, they're looking for a breeding stallion. I would love to be able to say that there's enough of this horse out there in, in, in sons that uh, a team of geldings is feasible, but right now I'm, we're not going to sell a stud colt to anybody who's going to cut the horse. Now that's kind of ballsy to say that. (laughs) Okay. I just was corrected. No, it's not. No, it's not because genetically and uh, otherwise, this this horse, we, we need to see a lot more of the old style being out there, being used, as, as Lynn said, I agree, being used, being out there, being available. And then, yeah, then, then, then there can be room. But right now, no. Now, what I found fascinating in the dog world, I don't know if it's going to work in, in the draft horse world, in the Persian world, but 
um, I've thought about this. I've thought about if you sold a stallion, let's say, to someone, but you kept the papers or the papers were in partnership for let's say the first two years, they could not cut that horse. They could not sell that horse without your permission because your name would be on the paperwork. Now this could open up a huge ass Pandora's box. It could be a nightmare. I, I, I do see there's a lot of caveats to it, but it would help separate the wheat from the chaff on who's got, who, who even looks at your animals and the possibility of buying them. If they're like, you know what? That is a fiery hoop that I want no business jumping through, then fine. Next, go to the next horse and we'll go to the next prospective buyer. That's something, I'm not saying that we're gonna do that, but it's something that I've pondered. Um, when it comes, cause again, we're looking specifically uh, for the context of the old style here. Um, as we, as, as we can all know, it's the precious vessel. It's that womb that's carrying these babies. Our mares are getting older. We're retaining our daughters. And there, there are people that are looking for, for mares, look, obviously looking for fillies because that's, that's your quote unquote money maker. Um, you know, even though I want to perpetuate this and I, I, and I want to see this revival of, of the old style being kept at that same level of, of attention and accolades, I think that you are going to start seeing people that breed this type of horse circling the wagons and not necessarily just selling a horse to anybody who uh, has a checkbook and a pen in their hand. Now, I can't speak for everybody. Everybody's financial situation is unique and, and I wanna be respectful, but yeah, I, I, I don't see us selling a horse to somebody who wants to do a hunt seat or dressage. I mean, they might not want the horse anyway, but, um, but I don't think that we're gonna be, be very conscientious about talking to the person and what they wanna do with the horse. And chances are, it's gonna be people who are sustainable agriculture, farm to market garden, that are gonna be using the horse consistently um, and that may mean we breed less, we breed, we breed fewer mares, but at least we are keeping to the standard that we, that we want to adhere to. Um, who, does anyone else have a comment? I do, if you, nobody else is jumping in. Please go ahead, yeah. Okay, um, I think you have uh, some uh, good points there that we can learn from some of the purebred dog people. Um, like I just saw in the comments, somebody saying, you know, part ownership in stallions. Um, what some purebred dog breeders do, whether it be with a stallion or even with a mare, if, if say you sell a, a filly to somebody who just wants to ride her and, and just keep her and love her, um, is you can write up a contract, a buying contract that you have the right to breed that animal in the future. Once or twice, it depends if it's a, a stud, it would be a stud or a, or a female. Um, so it's things to consider to keep everybody, again, it depends what you're comfortable with. Um, and I think it's very much something to keep an eye on. And I know it's difficult to um, when letting go, how much do you let go and how much do you kind of keep the hold of everybody so you know where your animals go. But we just ran into a perfect example of this here last year. Um, it's actually been a, a couple of year thing coming to the end. But we um, got a hold of a registered Canadian mare from an SPCA seizure. And a lady who was involved got a hold of us because she knew we were involved in driving and, and that's what we do. And we happen to know some people who were looking for more Canadians. So we, uh, long story short, we ended up getting this horse, the people who wanted her, financial changes, they couldn't take her. So we had her for a year and a half. Um, she was an older mare. And um, her turns out her bloodlines were some of the very last of her line 
out of Quebec, where they originate from. So she was a very valuable genetic horse, but she's 20 years old. Mm -hmm. There's no background to whether she'd been bred before or not. And our financial situation changed. So I was not able to attempt to breed her. We just couldn't afford the, the, because all of our stallions are live cover only and the trucking and everything else, it just, it fell through. We finally found a lady willing to take her. She has a stallion. She drove six hours to come and get her. Um, you know, so it, hopefully so she's able to get at least one foal from this mare. We had to do all the paperwork to try, because she was microchipped. So yeah. they were able to find her papers. But it gives you an idea that the, the Canadian horse went from recovering back to critically endangered two years ago because horses have disappeared. New owners have not taken the papers. So on one hand, I think we almost have to be nitpicky, you know, and have the yearly phone call. Hey, do you still have the horse? <laughs> you know, like, and it's, I want to say it, it could be annoying to have to do that, but it's something that I think we each have to consider going forward to try and keep these heavy horses uh, so we know where they are. It's a tricky balance because, you know, here I'm saying these things, but it, believe it or not, this old girl came from a punk rock ethos and um, I don't like people telling me what to do. <laughs> and nobody does, nobody does. <laughs> and Jenny just says, oh, I know that. So I, I hear what you're, I definitely hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, theory, practice, theory, practice. Um, but I guess really coming down to what's for the greater good of the horse and, and the breed and um, really, really walking the walk. I, I, can, I can let some of my punk rackness go, go down, the, down the toilet. It doesn't serve me that well anyway. Um, so, uh, David Siders, I see you trying to enter two times and it's not happening. So uh, James, you wrote in the comments, also we need to discuss the driving single question. If people start working shorter horse single, they end up wanting their next horse to be short. Okay, as well they should. It's, a, it's, a, it's far easier to just throw a harness on a shorter horse. There's, oh. there's no question about that by golly. Um, but uh, can you expand on on what you're okay. what you're saying? That stems from the part of the first question you started with. I have a horse. It's boarded. I can't afford two horses at a boarding facility. Could somebody teach me single? Basically, um, we discussed how do we. I, I'm part of the group that advertises in rural heritage the plowing match in kentucky every year and a couple other places they advertise um and the big question and debate for about five minutes was how do we get more people interested and coming and participating because other than three families worth of little kids there aren't and mine being one of those families there aren't many people in their 30s 40s as part of this group it's 55 maybe at the youngest all the way to 80s um so maybe we should discuss or use the great pertrons page to connect people regionally hey i want to learn how to drive um because the only way you're really going to do this well is is seeing like with somebody showing you and mm -hmm. really i'd say you could get into it for five six hundred bucks mostly most of that's in harness thank you for triggering my memory um the day, i'm not sure if the date is the 20th or the 27th and i apologize no. but uh of this month the draft animal power network is going to be doing a webinar tele zoom meeting just like this that is going to be talking specifically about the conformational qualities of a farm horse 
and the 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 driving there's it's going to be part and parcel so i encourage you to go to the draft animal power network facebook page and uh click click and, and join the network if you choose to uh denny's going to be speaking i'm emceeing jason julian is going to be on there um a couple different other people from the uh suffolk and um no, Ralph Rice is not on it. And uh, uh, someone from Canada whose name escapes me. I don't think it's Shires. But um, also, oh, Spotted Draft. The Spotted Draft is going to be speaking about the conformational mechanics um, when it comes to a quality working animal. So we're talking about in harness. Um, and I will also be posting that in the Great Persians for Great People group. Um, yeah. You're right. There's a lot of people that are more apt if, if they only have one horse, it's typically going to be um, a horse that they ride instead of drive. So so what you're saying is you've got a local Teamsters club of three people and you're having a hard time getting getting interest in it. Is that what you're saying, James? No, uh, we participate in the Eastern Kentucky Draft Horse and Mule Association, and they've been hosting a plowing competition every October for the last five years now, six years. Okay. Um, and during our annual meeting, you know, the there's there's three young families. The remainder of that group, the other ten or fifteen people there, are all sixties to eighties. You know, knees are getting sore. They want the group to keep going. So when um, the original question you read, when she said, hey, I'm, you know, I, I would love to learn how to drive single. Um, I think we need to focus on that, that other original question of, I have a trail horse and I'm not opposed to driving. I just can't go buy a second horse and pay whatever monthly board costs mm -hmm. and hay bill and feed bill mm -hmm. um so maybe we and maybe it's it's more of a statement than a question maybe we need to get more um open up more connections for people who are in different regions of like i know a group that would love to host a basic how-to day like they were talking of having just a field day in different stations and one station we have some horses for people to groom another station you get to throw harness on four horses get harnessed 10 times mm -hmm. 20 times in an hour um but maybe part of the preserving the old style is drawing interest by connecting people who are interested in horses or have a horse but they don't know everything they can do with it yeah um again once again i'm going to point you to the video that i will i will share a link for that for the youtube video if we i don't know if we're going to have time to do that tonight um but in fact i know we're not but um having the horse be a part of everyday life is I think really what you're talking about to, to a point. Um, the, the thing is, is that the person that owns one horse and does trail riding, but also would like to learn to drive, are they gonna want to walk behind a walking plow? Because your single horse is not going to be able to pull a gang plow. So there's that. And then are then you're looking at Okay, so are they wanting to drive cart? Are they wanting to drive some some single with shavs, um, buggy type of situation? Um, and 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 they're doing this by themselves. They're doing this for uh, in some sort of wagon train type of situation, or are they doing it for for show? Um, because if if they're doing it by themselves, that's fine. If they're doing it with their grandkids and their little kids, that's fine. But if they want to be part of a community and say, I'd like to do hay rides, 
and sleigh rides, um, you're only going to get so many people on there. And I know that that sounds like common sense and you're probably rolling your eyes at me, but a lot of people don't think about that stuff. So right, right. If, and I, so I guess it's a matter of is it is it a community thing? Is it is it is it what's the association and um, what's what's the end goal? Um, I'd, I'd say at least the end goal is to get more people doing something with horses, especially the older style uh, draft horse. Um, and and I, I think it, unless we start showing people what they're capable of, I'll just give a brief anecdote and then um, call it good. I have a client with horses she hopes to drive, but um, she's still putting all of the pieces together. So she currently has uh, four, five, five horses, four horses she doesn't do much with. Um, but I've tried, I, she'll, I'll have her come out to my farm one day because um, our daily routine is often one horse feeding a couple hundred, 300 pounds of hay on a sled. Um, and if we're feeling like using two or have time and want to do more than just feed hay, we'll hook two. And, you know, yes, there is a point to which we need to know what work is possible, but there's also a lot of work and enjoyment, like at a, a boarding facility that, um, you know, how funny would it be for a, a hunter jumper barn to have that random trail rider who owns a perch on all four bales of hay out to the feeder just because they can and they feel like doing it. That that's kind of my point is that um we need we, there has to be some way we can connect people who have an interest with outlets with local clubs and local um groups that maybe they they can't do the wagon train but sure they they'd find somebody to ride along with um and then somebody has their hand up so that's my piece about it okay um there's a lot of tentacles on that octopus and i think that it's it's there's there's a lot to be said when it comes to youth um getting the youth involved um, back in the 70s, my dad and a, and a few different draft horsemen in LaPorte County, Indiana, started a the Wagon Masters Club. The, it was the 4-H club, and it was we kids, and then they have an open class for the adults, um, and it really kind of looked like it was about who can redneck the other one, out redneck the other one with a beer can and a cigarette hanging out of the mouth, but it evolved. And it's one of the premier youth organizations. What they do is they do a showmanship. Rather than have it be halter classes for the, for the horse, it's more about showmanship for the 4-H'er. For and then they do what's called a farm and fancy um, uh, event where the big hitches will come in. That's the fancy part. And then every other class, it's staggered a, a farm class which would be you know, a farm horse on a farm cart. It doesn't have to be elaborate. Um, there'll even be a, farm, a horse drawn farm implement class, which could be either a team or a single horse. Um, it staggers and it's, it's really a nice thing because it gets people out there, but there's never a wait because you've got the, the hitch class going and then right as soon as they go out that gate, in comes a farm class. So that works out really well. I do think though that um, we've got to get the parents as involved as the kids. Kids, there will come a time that they don't want to do what their parents want them to want, the, want them to do just because it's their parents. Um, and it could be that, well, I'll use my mom. My mom taught piano lessons for 35 years. She would always prefer to teach adults because adults had a little bit of skin in the game. The kids were doing it because the parents wanted them to and the parents were paying for it. 
she always preferred to teach the adults because the adults were really there to learn. That was a choice that they were making. But that being said, after 35 years of teaching piano lessons, I can count on literally one hand, in fact, like two fingers of students that would say, that was the biggest waste of my time. I can't believe I had to go through that. Your mom was nice, but I really hated every moment of it. No, the lion's share of those people, those kids that grew up say, I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have practiced more. I wish. Now those 35 to 50 year old people that might have a little bit of money to play around with getting a team or one horse, have getting a five acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, or, or um, leasing space in a barn. I think those people need to have our encouragement too. I'm not saying that we put the kids out to pasture. I'm not saying that the, we leave the kids behind whatsoever at all, but let's get these parents involved. Let's, let's create those scenarios because that's gonna be who drives the trailer. Whether it's, the, whether it's the implements or whether it's the horses, that's gonna be where these kids get to go into these shows or going to these events. And I, I think sometimes we, we're putting a lot of effort into the kids and I'm not saying that's a bad thing again, but like I said, the example is how many, how many of any of us said, I wish I would have paid attention when I was younger. I wish that I would have appreciated the experience more. So, let's give those those people a second chance in, in getting out there and, and learning some things. As far as the one horse um, and, and the driving teams, I know that, that um, Patrick Nample, I believe his last name is, he's very proactive. He's in Northern Wisconsin or Central Wisconsin. He's very proactive about saying, hey, I'll teach you how to drive up to a six horse hitch. You know, we're good, come on over. He's very good with that. Um, some people are better teachers than others. Some people just don't have the knack for mentoring, um, but then that's okay. That's okay. Um, some people are going to want to talk about the business. If you follow, uh, RFD TV, Rural Heritage, and I've seen Jason Julian's videos on YouTube and, and are friends with Jason Julian and seen his, his long videos and his farming videos, he will say to you, I am not doing reenacting. I am making a living using draft animal power. He will do classes and he will do clinics, but he is going to pull no punches and he will not tolerate somebody that five minutes after they, they get out of their car and he talks to them, them thinking they know everything. That's not how he's gonna work. And I think that you might find some of the old timers don't have the patience for that. Um, that's kind of a tangent, but uh, I, I feel that if you've got people that are interested, I think I, I'm, I'm a little confused still as whether you're talking about getting people involved in your group or in the old style. Um, that's part of why I show photos in my group of the old style. We talk about a breed standard. They didn't have to really have a breed standard in the 30s because the breed standard was in the cotton picking fields. That was the breed standard. That was the breed standard. So this, this, this changeover of, of what a horse, a, a modern horse or, a, or, a, or, what, or, or an old star, that wasn't the situation. Why we decided that there needed to be a change, kind of stupid, but that's what happened. And if I don't sign in and listen to the meeting, then I can't get the video afterwards to listen to it and get names and contact information. Doris, you record Okay. I know you want to look at this. We'll get this up next. Okay. We're just I just want to look at it and see what it's going to take to get it going. I want to sure. sit in the sun and play with it. I found, I found the mute button. There we go. Okay. So, um, Cindy, let's try to hook up, hook you up with with Patrick. Let's we'll try to find somebody that you can uh, do some do some driving with. See how you like it. Um, and my friend here is been so patient. Marie, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Please go ahead, my love. 
Okay. Uh, I just want to tell you that, that for quite a few years now, we've been putting an ad in the Perchin magazine that we're, we're helping people find these old style horses. And in the process of doing that, we've come up with some really, really good ones. And I know they're listening right now. One of them is Leonard Kramer that does this with me. And another one is uh, John Hahn, Tim Miller, David Knepp. Uh, there's probably more, mm -hmm. but we try to, um, I know that the last colt that Tim Miller sold, he made sure that those people were going to keep him a stallion, that they were going to keep him registered and that they had a, a program to keep, keep uh, him papered. If you don't paper them, you don't know where they came from. And so we try to help people with this. And, and I have a book of just all these people that have called me. Some are, you know, some of them fall by the wayside because they don't want to pay anything. And, and you know, they're going to get tired of raising these horses if they don't get money for them. But uh, I'm asking that, that uh, Leonard Kramer, John Hahn, David Knepp, uh, Tim Miller, come and help me here. Are they on there? Um, they uh, actually, I think David is on the call. Uh, David called me last night. Okay. To remember. I think he is on the call. Leonard's on the call. Um, John was going to be, but I don't know if he is. And Tim was going to be, I don't know if he is. Um, uh, there are pockets out there and there are plenty of Amish. There are Amish that have registered horses that don't have their phone numbers in the directory, unfortunately. Um, right. For whatever well, reason. David Knepp, David Knepp has uh, uh, a horse from Tim Miller. And, and that's how we try to help people to match them with people that, that are serious about this. Mm -hmm. And Marie and, is... And, Marie is on Facebook. She is a, a member of the Great Persons for Great People group. Um, and uh, Leonard is not, but they work together very well. And, and Marie is the person that uh, suggested that I call Dennis Wetchen uh, going on three years ago <laughs> talking about horses. And here we are. So. Right. And Den Dennis has an awesome stallion, too. Yes, he does. And we just have to make sure that they go to the, and I know that they, you were worried about that said going uh, out there, you know, where I'm talking about. Yes, I anyway, do. And then, and then I'm glad that worked out. Yep. But you find so many people that they get them and then they don't have any, any registered mares. What good's that going to do? Well, you know, and, and we were talking before the recording hit, and I will say this, get, get the DNA, get that DNA going, at least have that because you'll be able to see, you'll be able to see parentage and the DNA doesn't change. The DNA is gonna be with right, the horse right. for the life of the horse. And we be, we'll be able to see something, even if the pedigree committee says, nope, not happening. There's no way this horse is gonna get papered. Okay, then try to go through the, the, the crossbred registry. Make sure that you're breeding that animal to a registered horse so the, at least we've got that pedigree happening. Um, but right. get, get the DNA going here. And, and who knows what doors that might open. Um, and, and realize that that horse doesn't know whether it's got papers or not. That's for us. And it is for the That's horse in the sense of giving that horse an opportunity for their lineage and their legacy to be, to be carried forth. Um, right. But, but yeah, right. I, I would agree with you. So, so I would say well, I'd, like, I'd like for like David to talk or, or yeah, uh, I'd be happy to or, or uh, Molly. Uh, you know what? They need to be on the group then, sweetheart, because I don't, I don't think they're on it. Um, but I do. Leonard, Leonard is, right? Leonard is on. And I do want to say that David is, David, let me think. Mm. Might have been his son. They, he might have had to go to bed because they're an hour ahead of us. I don't see him. Oh, that could be. That could be. 
I don't but see. But another, another thing in our travels with my husband, Dick, who is now deceased, uh, we had a Percheron school at our house. And and we had enough horses. We had 35 head at one time, and all all of them could drive horses. And I know that the per, the Perton people kept the people out at a hotel, and they had breakfast there. And the and these people came up to us, and then they said, "We we want to come to your house. We want to come and 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 watch a harness them. We want you to see a harness them and hook them up and all that." Well. It was was so that they the Perchin people wanted wanted them all ready to go, but uh, I mean okay. anybody could have come to our house. We had lots of people that came there to learn. And, and actually, and Dick, yeah. and Dick went to people. And, Dick went all the way out to the Pacific Northwest and helped somebody get us. Oh established. yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. Hey Sarah, he also, yes. Hey Marie. He also went yeah. Hey, it's Lori Olson. Yeah. Hi, Lori. <laughs> How are you? I just wanted Good. to comment. I re I remember those days, and yeah. I that's kind of that's kind of what. Go ahead. Well, and Oli and and you know all those old teamsters. I mean, didn't weren't they just special? Oh, I know, and, they and were that's all willing. Your dad was there when we did that school. I know, and that's kind of what me and, and Lori Hammerspach and Ann Clary, we kind of want to get something like that going again. And that's kind of what right. I told Ann Clary. Um, you know, I kind of reminisced about those days and, and how fun that right. was. And and we had right. so many people and so much fun. And we had the support of the Pertran Association. And I think that's kind of what the difference is. Um, you know, right. the Pertran Association is kind of veering, you know, towards the, the hitch type and you know we're trying to get the education fund involved and right. and, and trying to get back think, to that old go ahead i think i think that at those congresses or or even the shows why aren't they having farm classes at these shows and right. why don't they make it just as big a deal to right be in the in the, in the farm classes it is inside you know, right. I guess it's back to Bill Grimm when he had those out in Lexington, Virginia, and he announced right. and he did everything. And, and those were, I mean, and all those horses were just really nice looking. Right. And everybody you know, and, care of their horses. They bathed them and, and yeah, I and, mean, even and you guys had farm a, horses. And you guys had a really good thing going down there in Hudson, Iowa. And, you know, it, it was just always such a great time, you know, and, and all of us, you know, even if you didn't know anything, you know, you were welcome and we could just do, yeah. you know, just learn from each other. And that, that's kind of what we yeah. need to kind of go back to. That's what I think. Right. The, plow, the plowing match. Yeah. We had that fun time plowing match. Yeah. <laughs> and Lynn McVeigh good old days. was one of the judges. He's a, he's a really good judge. Yeah. And, and, you know, we showed a lot of people and then we were lucky that Dick called Mishka and had him come and take pictures and we gave them away as the, the, the ones that won, you know, in each of the classes. And then right. he used them in his, in his, in his calendars and stuff, yep. you know. And, yeah, and that, uh, that really encouraged people to, to get involved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's and, something but they just got to make a big deal out of it, you know, call, call, Mr. Yeah. Call, you know, I mean, I just couldn't believe when Dick could get on the phone and call Michigan, here he come, you know, <laughs> and, and I mean, all you have to do is call and ask. And so I, it was just a wonderful time. I think the thing is, is I remember after the Congress in 2010, um, people were online and really talking about it and, and all sorts of things. And somebody from California said, boy, I sure do wish they would do something like this out here. Mm -hmm. And I immediately thought, oh, <laughs> be the change. <laughs> be the change you want to see in the world. Because the, the Congress cannot go to where there's no horses. And right. uh, it's, it's just not plausible but do what you can bloom where you're planted 
in those areas where where you are if if that's your inclination if you can if you have to work during the daylight hours and you can't i don't think anybody should look down their nose at anybody for for not being able to do it but bloom where you're planted because that is going to plant these seeds um, it may, we may never see a Congress in Southern California. And I don't know that I would take horses. <laughs> I would be driving on the freeways <laughs> in Southern California anyway with horses, but um, yeah, I, it's something that it's just a matter of bloom where you're planted and, and have an understanding that if you live in an area where there are not a lot of Persians, it is simply going to have to be a matter of, of ponying up the dough and and paying for a hauler to come out there because that's the only way they're going to be out there at this at this point um it's just well if you're if you're really interested in the perching horse i mean when we started out we had one mare and then she had one baby and that's what we drove and we we made a living with our horses we did weddings funerals trolley rides <laughs> when we need more than one trolley we build another one and we just had all kinds of stuff going on. Plus the stuff at our farm, you know, the sleigh rides and hay rides and then the events we had. And we were always doing something in the plowing contest. And, and, and I mean, people, sometimes we had to ask people to come and drive our horses. And, and you know, usually Dick knew who they were, but they learned because our horses were broke. I'm going to cut you off here, Marie, and not that I want to, but you bring up a really good point. And it may need to be, it needs, it needs to be for another conversation. And I don't want to say that men are not going to be allowed, but um, I, I'm seeing so many more women getting involved with draft horses, whether it's the one horse that is, that is being uh, in a, uh, being in a barn and someone else's barn or someone that's got, 20 acres or whatever it is, um, we may need to have a conversation at another time about right. these challenges, especially when it comes to the, the farm style. I think Eric Marzak is a fantastic example. And, and Lori, you really know your way, or, way around uh, a field. Oh yeah, Lori's, Lori's good. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that, you know, I don't want to put burden. Thank you. I have to say that I agree with you. What? I don't have to say that I agree with you 100%. Can you hear me? I don't know who's talking. I would have to say I agree with you 100%. Who is talking? Because when they come to my farm, it's always, this is Mark Gross. Thank you. Okay, got it. Can you? There. I just didn't know it, it didn't pop up. Yeah, in when that, like in the summertime when school's out. That's okay. In the summertime when school's out, it's the girls that come. We I never see any boys. It's the girls that come. They want to come and they want to show them how to trim their feet, show them how to pick their feet up. It's the girls. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd hardly get any boys here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I'm, not, power. and I'm not sure what that is, and I I don't want to don't don't want to make any disparaging comments whatsoever. Um, so I'm not gonna. But I think it might be something that we talk about because there, you know, there are challenges. There there are challenges, um, and they're unique. So maybe we should do that another time. If you're interested in that, send me some feedback. But I do want to get to these questions. If you need to go to bed, if you need to get your kids to bed, it's 940 Eastern time. And I don't want anybody saying that I uh, kept them awake. If you've got to go, you've got to go. Uh, Janine Bird says, my mare is a chunk and I have been unable to find a, side a size stride match for her in harness. Um, how tall is she? What is her heart girth? What uh, collar does she, size does she wear? Um, uh, if you can give us some of those parameters, we might be able to help you. I, we can do, we can, we can see what we can do. Um, and otherwise, are you, are you working her single? Um, or did she have a team or does she have a teammate and it makes it a, the stride a little bit weird? Um, we can try and help you find a horse. Can't promise anything. But uh, we can try. 
Um, the whole old horse, also we keep scattered, find a good local club and resource like Jason Julian. I say even watching Jason Julian, we watch him a lot, love his approach um, to life and what he's doing with his family and his work ethic. And um, this most recently he's been down in Illinois, he's been logging to Who Tied the Pup with a young man who I had the pleasure of eating Thanksgiving dinner with at Leonard's in 2019. So um, I, that's been a real big fun time to, to watch that process of, of logging. He's working people. He's not puttering around. He's not, this isn't a hobby. This is how he makes a living uh, as, a, as a dairy farmer working with horses. And my hat is off to him. The challenge is, and there we go. We're going to talk about this real freaking quick, people. The challenge is American Brabant and crosses and mules and whatever. Um, the chronic progressive lymphedema that is so prevalent in Brabant's is causing them to look outside of Brabant's and Belgians to try to clean up these legs. And... Uh, mm. I used to have a real big bee in my bonnet because they were using registered mares for this. I have since heard, and I don't know that this is scientific fact, but I have since heard that it is said that the mare line is what is making, is carrying on this progressiveness. So that's why they're looking at Persian mares to breed to their Brabant stallions in order to clean up these legs. That Be that as it may, that's one more mare that's being taken out of the gene pool. On one hand, these people aren't farting around. They are working with these horses. They're not trying to change. They're not trying to make show Brabants and show Suffolk's. They're not trying to do that nonsense. They're trying to have good working horses. Um, so it's a, it's a balancing act because I don't want to be disparaging, but I think that that's also something that we have to look at when it comes to um, our pre these precious wombs of our mares being used for surrogates, um, you know, um, what's the word, uh, receptive, re um, re um, uh, embryo transfer mares. Um, we're looking at the crossbreds that's typically onto a, a heavier mare with a lighter stallion, a lighter bred stallion. Um, again, people let want what they want and that's beautiful. But again, that is taking that mare out of the first ring gene pool. Um, does anybody have any comments on that? Okay, then I will just let that sink in. <laughs> okay, do we have an existing directory or can we put, or is there a call to put together a directory? Are you talking about old style horses, Diane? If you just want to type in the chats, you can. Yes, I am actually, Sarah. Um, I'm talking old style horses. I would be interested in helping out if we ever do decide to do something like that. Or if I, I need people, I need names. I need yeah. to know what people have. Yeah, but I would be more than interested to put together something like that. You know, the challenge is... Um, on one hand, it's going to take not a lot of time because there aren't, aren't a lot. Um, but on mm -hmm. the other hand, um, a lot of those horses aren't registered or they're in right. the of people who are not readily available. I mean, I've looked at horses I've, I, and I do love the new, the new stud book and that you can see phone numbers, but if phone numbers aren't there, then that's about postcard writing. Um, I think that it would be fantastic to also get the... Mm -hmm volunteers for the Persian Association of, uh, Association of America to um, clean up and add in the 250,000 horses who aren't in the register in, in the stud book at all. So that when we go back looking at these old bloodlines, we don't come up with Oak Haven something or other, because that's absolutely incorrect information. Yeah, so I'd like to comment on that, you know, Sarah, I know that Diane uh, and myself, at least at a minimum, have volunteered through Stacy to help with that effort. 
uh, of updating that. But is it possible that Marie or and or Leonard can provide the information that they must have on paper that we could then digitize so that you know it's not writing a letter and asking for this information. It's more readily available to people. I can't comment well, on that. Except, I, 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 who, who was that that was talking? That was, that was Sharon Kish. I can't comment on that, but I can also say that there are some people. This is going to sound hypocritical. There's some people that don't want to be known. There's some people that that uh, they're contacting Leonard and Marie, uh, and they may not want their business known. They they may be contacting them looking for horses and having Marie and Leonard as their point person. And then the decision is on their end on, on how they want to go about their connection. Some people are ouchy. Believe me. Yeah, I was more speaking of the resources of, you know, here's a bunch of folks who have old style Percherons that might be available that you could contact to save a step, you know, because Unfortunately, if something happens in the future to either of them, you know, we're going to lose that information as well. Um, that would be something to talk to them about. Um, that's something to talk to them about. Um, I think that a directory is, is good, but um, I think that due diligence is good too. I think that that finding getting some getting up there and and doing doing some research, you might find a diamond in the rough that nobody else has found, and it might be because of your own due diligence. Um, I, I, I don't think that either of us were talking about doing it in lieu of doing your own due diligence, but you know people will have different you know, lifestyle demands, et cetera. And if it, the people don't want to share, that's fine. But I think that it was you know it's a it's a noble gesture to offer to people who are interested as saying, hey, I have old school Percherons if you're interested. Because if you look at the Percheron news, you almost only see the hitch style horses. Well, that's a, that's a, in, in what, in what capacity, ads or in, in editorial? Ads, right? If you're, if you're a new person to the Percheron breed and you get the Percheron news and you look in here and you say, oh, I, wouldn't mind contacting a breeder. Yes, there is Marie and Leonard in here, and I think that that's super valuable. But there's also, you know, pages and pages of shiny, glossy hitch teams that show a Percheron, and that sets for new people the idea of this is what a Percheron should look like. And that's why in the group that it's free that I post and other people post what an old style looks like. So people don't have an idea of what that is. Advertising costs money. You know what I'm yes. saying? Advertising costs money. So uh, and I, we chose to do an ad in the Draft Horse Journal. And we chose to do an ad in Rural Heritage. Uh, that was our budget for ads. And uh, that's, that's where the the people that have the modern horses are putting ads in, they're, they're marketing their stallions or whatever their hitch is, whatever their money is, but that's where they're, that's their budget. That's where that comes from. Um, putting it, putting a photo on any of the groups, not just my group, but any of the groups on social media or drafts for sale, that kind of thing. That's something that people can do and by looking at, okay, this horse that you post, that I posted, let's say I posted, okay, I'm going to look at that horse's pedigree. And then, oh, okay, that horse has got this in it, Farman. Let me see what else has got Farman in it. That horse is a, is a, uh, is an imported horse. Let's see what else is out there. That's what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't, an editorial. So, so I think the thing is um, getting more editorial about the old style horse in the Persia news is something that we need to do. Would you well, agree? Well, you can write a story. You can, you can well, place the story a, in there. She's always here, looking for stories. Right I'm sorry, Mark, is that you, Mark? Because it doesn't show your face. 
So I can't see if you're talking or not. Marie. There's a man's way. Tell her, write, it, write a story. You can write a story for in there. Here's, here's what we're going to wind up having is, is the younger generation is going to get this imprinted picture in their mind of this 19 hand hitchy type horse. And they're never, they're, they're going to lose what the true meaning of the old draft where we came from. And, and I'm very, I, I'm with Sharon and, and, and everybody here. That, that's really a great concern of mine because I came from old parents. My, my daddy was 80 years old in 2014, passed away. And we log with these horses. We've always had the shorter, nice, stocky built horse. And everything you look at on the internet, everything you look at in our magazine, uh, it's the, the imprint of this big, drafty, gated horse that that's not where they came from. I would agree. I would agree. And that, but the thing Comment. is, if you look, if you look at the draft horse journal, let's say the draft horse journal from 20 years ago or a dozen years ago, same thing with the Pershing news. Those are infinite. Those are thicker. I'm looking at 25 years of them stacked up here and they're thicker publications. And there, there's not now, there's not going to be the advertising in them that there was because of the internet. And because there's fewer people breeding, that's just the way of the evolution of <laughs> printed media. It just it is what it is. Um, and but <laughs> we do have with the internet, we do have access to a lot of photographs, a, a crazy amount of photographs that we have access to. Pinterest, if nothing else, has a boatload of photos to look at what do we have today one more time okay so so again i think the thing is that sharon finding out who has horses and making the phone calls and and networking i think is an integral part of the horse community um Having a directory of breeders who are breeding to outside mares, let's say, uh, that have an old style stallion, I think is a fantastic idea. One of the things that has been kind of a running joke in the horse world, the draft horse world, the Persian world, the old style Persian world is a lot of those people don't want to part with the money. A lot of people don't have the money, and 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 even fewer people have money to advertise in a, in a publication. Yeah, but why does it have to cost anything? A directory on Facebook, you know, I'm not super technical, but it shouldn't be that difficult. I know you post the pictures; it's kind of hard because of how Facebook works from a search perspective sometimes to find it. But I, I don't know. I, if there's no information, it doesn't make any sense to go do it. If you're asking me to go out and start calling people and going, hey, do you have an old style percher on whatever? I, I'm sorry, I don't have the time. If people wanted to send the information in, it's a lot easier, right? And so if someone already has it or could, if people on the call want to send it into a place, I think that makes it easier. But that's what it's going to take, literally. I mean, I've, I have gone in the 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 stallion directory on the on the website and i have looked somebody up i've looked a horse up i've looked who owned that horse or bred that horse and i've picked up the phone right and so have i but i'm just saying that if i'm that person at the other end of the phone and i want to be known for whatever it is that i have then for me to push it forward in a way that's not expensive is just a help to people because when you go to the percheron news here are all current people that are 100% willing to uh, hook you up with a, a quote unquote new style Pertron. That's mm -hmm. my only point. Mm -hmm. I think it's just going to be a matter of, of, it's a slow process and it's going to be a matter of, um, okay, you're going to take states A through G and somebody else is going to take states, 
I through M, somebody's going to take Ohio because that's where most of the horses are. And I think it's just going to be a matter of that and then putting that information together. It's going to be a long process, but I think it's worth it. It's just going to be a matter of um, after the question of is there, the question is, so what do you want me to do? And I think that that's going to be the, the way it's going to have to, to be. Um, so if I tell you what, if some, if, if you all are saying, let's do that, then slide me either a, a, a private message or send me an email and we can work on that. Um, someone did say, um, uh, let me get back here because I want to make sure that, uh, uh, goodness me, sorry. Um, that's a lot of messages. Um, DNA, okay. Let me see here. I think I've lo I'm losing some messages. Okay, Larry Klein needed to sign off, but he said, be more involved in the Persian Horse Association. Um, sure, be more involved in Persian horses. Let's start there. And, and where that takes you. If that takes you to be a member, great. If that takes you to registering horses, fantastic. If you find your ideal horse that is not or is a cross, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm not gonna say boo, because I think that it's about what's gonna work for you. But in the context of old style, um, yeah, sure, the more people that are involved, the more people are gonna take notice. And I think it's gonna be a, uh, a ripple effect. And I think that that is fantastic. Um, uh, okay, um, maybe Uncle Joe to do a rural heritage show. Um, yeah, I think rural heritage is a wonderful proponent. Um, I'm thinking in terms of people who are interested in volunteering to be a part of a directory. I never would never force, course, or post anyone that did not want to uh, have information. I know the person who is always looking for articles too. Yes, now I will say this, uh, and I've had this experience and it makes me giggle. Um, called a person. Uh, who has a registered stallion, considered old style. And I said, I'd like to see a photo of this horse. And if you'd like, I can market this horse. I, I have a group and I can show the picture and stand outside mares and yada, yada, yada. He said, I will send you an email with the photo of the horse, but I do not want the horse on the internet. I am not making that up. So, and I, of course I want to honor that, but yes, you will find that there are people that do not want to be marketed the way we think of marketing. And so it's just gotta, it's gotta be one of those things. Thank you for being here, Sharon. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you for being here, my dear. Um, nine, it's 10 o'clock people. And I want to make sure, oh, uh, so to unmute yourself, Leonard, uh, do star six on your phone, on your keypad on your phone. I see your hand up. So but to unmute yourself, do star six on your phone and you will unmute yourself. Okay, my dear? And I'll be watching to see if that happens. Okay. Um, do you want to continue or do you want to end the call? I want to be respectful for people. If you, if you need to leave, you need to leave. It's 10 o'clock Eastern time, nine o'clock Central time. Yeah, we'll leave, we'll let those people be. Um, do we need to talk about PSSM one? I think that it's a matter of don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If a horse is, um, tested um, and it is only one copy of the gene. I, in, in Britain, they have really cracked down on this. If a horse has the two copies of the gene, I'm, I can't remember hetero and homozygous, so I'm not even gonna try. Two copies of the gene, they are immediately taken out of the gene pool. Uh, if there is one copy of the PSSM, 
they are going to be allowed to breed for the next five years. Um, and obviously with the, with the understanding that it's got to be conscientious, you would not breed to uh, another, another mare that has that issue. I do feel that it is an issue and it does need to be addressed. Um, PSSM1 stands for polysaccharide storage myopathy, which means tying up or Monday morning disease. If a horse hasn't been worked for a while, it can seem very sluggish. It can seem as if the muscles are wasting. Um, some suggest that it is crazy high percentage of draft horses that have PSSM1 in them. And some people are calling out for testing in very big ways. And um, sometimes it looks like a little bit of a witch hunt, to be honest with you, uh, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. Um, but I do, I do think that it's a matter of concern. But when it comes in the context of an old style horse, and again, this is my opinion, I feel that the genetic lines need to be um, looked at conscientiously. Now, if you're crossbreeding, absolutely, you're, you don't have to worry about genetic diversity. You're, cross, you're, you're, you're breeding two different breeds of horses. But when it comes to the old style, um, I think that the, gen the genetic diversity is more important. Right now, right now, I think that managing it with diet for any horse and working the animal is as important. But if these horses are being adapted to our lifestyle in the sense that we're only using them with very little, very, yeah, very sparingly, then, uh, that not working them and all of a sudden then working them and then feeding them a lot. I mean, they're gonna have some issues. There's just no doubt about it. Um, Jenny and I were talking about this. He did never even heard of PSSM1, heard of tying up and said, yeah, we had a horse like that. And we'd give her a tube of Harlem oil. We'd take her around the, the driveway. And by the time she was done, done with the driveway, she was good to go again. She was not bred on by the way, in case anybody's got issues. Um, but, at, but it wasn't because of the tying up, it was because they had a, needed a farm team and they couldn't let her go being bred and then having a baby. So they just didn't breed her so that they could keep her working. That's how they did it. Um, that's not necessarily how a lot of other people do it. Um, does anyone else have something they'd like to interject about that? Lori, you brought that question up. Did you uh, wanna speak on it anymore? Yes, my only concern is that um, a lot of people have asked me if I have genetically tested my mares um, for that, and I have not yet. Um, I, I do eventually plan on it, but it is an, at an expense. Um, but I, I, you know, a lot of people that, that want to do crossbreds think it's a, a, a big issue. And from the um, research that I've done, it's, it, it seems to be a issue only in the minds of saddle horse people. It's, it seems to be a um, prevalent concern. However, the symptoms are not there. So I, I'm not a vet. I only wish that I could um, elaborate on that more. So if, if anybody else has any other issues, or input, I gladly appreciate it. Can I say something? Yes, Dennis, would you like to say something? You're gonna have to speak up, please. That was Lori talking. Speak up so she can hear her. Lori? Just go on. Did you did you have any horses that when your when your dad was working horses, he he harnessed every day, didn't he? Pretty much, right. And the the only time that I had ever heard of Monday morning sickness 
was at a actual draft horse show. A horse had went down on the way to the show um, and nobody really knew what was going on. And come to find out, it was determined that the horse had Monday morning sickness. Of course, that was, you know, I was a kid probably 30 years ago. That was the first time I had ever heard of it. And it was in a Belgian. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not familiar with the disease. I've never dealt with it personally in my herd, you know. So I guess that's, to me personally, I don't think it's a big concern. But obviously, other people think it is. So. So I'm not sure how to deal with it with the public when I want to market my horses. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's my concern. My. Hey Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to hear if if he's speaking. Okay. So, I know he doesn't want to be in camera, but so well if you just yeah, he just they never had a problem with it other other than two times in the entire time that they were working horses and they worked horses every day. So that's why my concern is is that the PSSM1 is coming up to being more prevalent because these horses are not being used as much. Right. Um, and, and that's something, again, I don't want to shake my finger or look down my nose at anybody because they can only do what they do. They want, but, but if a horse is a luxury, and let's be realistic, it is. I don't care what the horse is. At this point in time in history, it's a luxury. And if, you're, if the horse is basically being a pasture pet, then we can't overfeed it. We, we can't be putting all this processed food in. Um, if a horse has it, then, and they don't want to breed, then, then I guess that that's a, that's a wonderful reason to not breed. But when it comes to the crossbreeding, um, I haven't, Dandy's not been tested. And I don't know that Dandy will be tested. Maybe, maybe not. But I am saying in, in, for me, that I'm not, I'm not testing him. So if, if a person wants to look the other way and, and go to another horse, that's, that is absolutely their prerogative to do so. For me, the genetic, the, the genetic components, good night, Terry, the genetic components for him for now are more important. Um, uh, we've got a lot of people that are wanting to, to breed their crosses, both warm bloods, weird, but fun, warm blooded folks, as well as people that are wanting to have a little more width in their cow horse. So, so ranch horses, Western horses, none of them, none of them have asked if he's, if he's tested. Not, not a one, not to say that's not going to happen, but the answer will be the same um, for right now. Because for us, our focus is the person draft horse, but we're willing to, to breed to anybody. The genetic diversity in the, in the person horse is our focus. And if they want to breed to somebody else, they can. But you brought up a fantastic question also. Is frame or size more important than foot or disposition? Um, I feel that foot is a part of frame and size myself. Um, so I feel that this, it's all interconnected. Disposition depends on, that's subjective. Um, I feel, and I think the bottom line is, you know, we're talking about a, an old style horse, okay? Any horse worth loving is, is worth loving, is worth having. So I'm not gonna condemn yeah. somebody that wants to love an 18 wheel horse. That's really right. fantastic. That's really fantastic. Well, and I guess my, 
my concern with that is a lot of people have asked, you know, well, what's what's the disposition of your horse? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of that goes back to environment, you know, and of course, personality. You know, I've had horses that have wanted to jump through fire for me, but don't like to be loved on in their face, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's all subjective and, you know, personality wise. And I, it's, it's hard to convey that to people. Um, but that's, that's kind of my, my thought that, that horses are a lot like people. They all have different personalities, you know, and yeah, they're gentle giants, but a lot of them have a great work ethic. That does not mean that they are lovey-dovey, you know, and that's just one of those things that, that's hard to convey to the newcomer, I guess. That's my only point with that. And I love what you just said, because just as people, and I don't want to be anthropomorphizing her, oh gosh, I swear <laughs> on all this holy, there are some horses that don't want to be ridden, that they want to be a driving horse and vice right, versa. Right, exactly. And it's really hard to say to somebody, and 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 I, I, I begrudge no one anything here, please, please don't take this personally, but I come from the light horse world, and now I want to drive a horse. And they're not understanding leg cues or this, 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 this. It's not that they don't want to, maybe. They just don't know what you're asking for yet. So there's that, okay. But I, I believe with every ounce of my being that there are some horses that just do, do not want to be ridden. I'm never going to be a bikini model, but that doesn't mean I don't like fashion, okay? So <laughs> exactly. So there are some horses that I'm going to tell you something. There is a stallion, it's in Dave Davies County and the Amishman was on the call tonight. He's got one of, uh, he's got a Modoc Herbert grandson out of uh, one of Marie's old mares. And we like the horse, he's a good looking horse. But then we saw a video that Tim Miller sent us of that mare in a, in a pulling contest. We're not big pullers, you know, that's not the gig here. But we saw that mare get down and she was, she was the mother effing show mare right then and there, folks. That was, that was her six horse hitch. She, and I'm about ready to cry because I'm really passionate about this. She got down and she knew what she was doing. That heart. That heart is there. She knew what she, she had a job to do she did it and it was freaking beautiful so that is so true that is so and true, that's true sarah I've, I've got i've got several nice mares that they've been raised around children from when they were a foal up to their yearling and um when they when we hitched them up for the first time now, of course, you know, I always had somebody wanting to ride them, but it was something about they knew they had a job to do. They knew what they were designed to do. It's like what God made them to do. And that's what they were happy doing. And you could tell it. They enjoyed it. You betcha. You betcha. And again, there are some horses that are all arounders that are versatile as the day is long. And my God bless them. Uh, there's there's something for everybody. But I, and that might need to be another conversation. So um, we've gone all, all over the place here, folks. And um, does anybody have anything that they'd like to say? Because it's 10, it's 10, 15 Eastern time. And I, Leonard, I, if you can hear me, I see you've got your hand up, but you've got to hit star, the asterisk on your phone, and then a six. And it'll toggle back and forth to being mute and unmute. Um, I don't know what else to tell you there, my friend. Um, but I'd love to hear what you have to say because I know you've got a lot, you've got decades of experience <laughs> and you're one of my favorite people. So I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, so star six, if you can hear me, okay. Um, anybody else have something that they'd like to say or a question or Sarah, you're full of crap. You can say that too.
are, are we ready to call it one? Um, hold on a second here. I'm not gonna play it. I'm not gonna play it, not gonna play it, not gonna play it. Let me minimize this and move it over here and give you the um, link to the old style Persian Revival French uh, interview that is available for anyone. It's public. So if you want to share that with someone who's not on the call, that's absolutely cool. Virginia will be putting an article in the Spring Draft Horse Journal talking about the uh, state of the uh, Persian horse, the 21, 2021 review of the Persian horse in France. Um, she's a fascinating person to talk to, has a lovely speaking voice, so that helps too. And yes, I'm going to apologize in advance for all the ums and, st and stuttering that I did in that interview. I am mortified, but... I'm going to blame it on old age. <laughs> um, anybody have anything else that they want to say before we sign off? Anything that you want to cover in another conversation, another meeting down the line, potentially, and I can do some research. I have one. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. If you're going to bring a, if you're going to bring an animal out of Canadian, out of Canada, how would we get it over here, transfer the paperwork, and go through the whole ordeal of getting it here, getting it a part of the American Pertron Association? I can say- That'd be a good that, conversation. Okay, um, and I will say this, I, 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 do have, I, I do have a little hitch in the get along sometimes when it comes to the Pertron Association, but not when it comes to that. They are, they are golden when it comes to that. They would be able to guide you through that situation. Now. COVID and all of that nonsense, they have no control over what goes on as far as getting a horse over the border. Uh, but I do know that the Hans um, recently bought, uh, what was it, six mares from the provinces and a stallion. And that was last fall. And they live in Nebraska. So there was the hauling they met in Northern Minnesota or North Dakota a horse came down and then they they transferred and then were hauled the rest of the way um but the canadian registry and the um, persian horse association of america have a ha have a relationship that is smooth as butter um so if everything is okay on that end um i believe it was that our it was the gentleman that had passed away that uh, there was a full page ad in the Draft Horse Journal. I, mm -hmm. Patterson was his last name. So um, they, they would be able to help you as far as the paperwork. If the horse's paperwork is okay in Canada, there should be no issue at all. There, this ha it, it's, there's really, what, what is considered Canadian bloodlines and what's considered American are, are so, so interwoven that, uh, Yes, we have the only mare that stayed in Canada, as far as we know. Oh, oh gosh, crazy. Um, but they're they're fantastic. They would be able to guide you through that process and and are wonderful people to work with. I, I think you, you can have your mind eased when it comes to that. Shipping semen, maybe a different story, <laughs> but that doesn't have anything to do with them. That's that's a part of the, uh, the uh, uh, Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Ms. Sarah, I can chime in on this a little bit. Go ahead. Yes, please. It's Diane. It's Diane. Um, my mom had a filly imported from Canada to here, and I can share a little bit of that process because I had to be involved, which was a lot of fun at my job when I was trying to work. But um, we ended up um, using a hauler that has the ability to obviously cross the border, which we did not. Um, but they were meeting her just on the other side of the border. The people that were bringing the horse, we were buying the horse from Brett Lucas from Lucasia Ranches. And she had to have, obviously Brett had to make sure that the filly had all her paperwork done on his side, particularly the vet paperwork. You do have to pay a vet at the border. 
And you also have to pay, you end up having to talk to basically customs of sorts. Um, that was the part that I got to deal with that was very eye-opening. Um, I never knew that we would have to label a horse's weight in pounds out like you would a large package. Um, but uh, the people are very, very helpful. As long as you have somebody who has done this before, I can promise you that it is not as stressful of a situation as you might think. Yes, there's a little bit more involved. Um, it takes a little bit more wheels to get things going. But as far as the registration papers being transferred, your Canadian breeder will send those papers to the Canadian Association. There is going to be a slightly more upcharge to have those papers come over to here and then be paid over here as well. But it can be done. And I promise it's not as bad as it sounds. As long as you've got all your ducks in a row, it's, it's a pretty easy process. So that's encouraging. Now, wow, Diane, was that time. in the time of COVID that, that, that this happened? Um, I Let me think here. Vi is, yeah, within the last two years, because she's, she's only two. So, yeah, she was, as soon as she was weaned, Brett had her sent down here to the U.S., and we they picked her up out there over in the Dakotas or wherever their crossing is over there. I've never been out that way. I apologize. <laughs> Not at least that far north. But uh, yeah, it was in within the last two years. And that was a concern, obviously. We were worried about getting her here and, and making sure that she got across the border over to here, but um, it it worked out okay. Mm -hmm. So Mark, you're you're in Mississippi, you said? And you're looking for a horse yes. in Canada, or you, you've you've looked at a horse in Canada. Um, I have looked. I have looked at a couple of things online. It's yeah. just really hard in Mississippi to find anything registered mm -hmm. uh, down here. I mean, they don't want to pay three thousand dollars for a horse. And uh, <clears throat> somebody made a comment earlier about how, you know, because we can't get the ads out, we can't get these things. No. Want to pay anything, and, and and I'm running this and across the border, uh, so I can. I'm either going to have to go under. My daddy started this, or either I'm going to have to find a new way. I might have to bring some bloodline here. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, uh, stay. Are are you in the Persian, the Great Persian for Great People group, Mark? I'm sorry, I don't recognize your name, and I apologize. <laughs> How did you find out about this tonight? That's all wrong. Come to mind, told me. Do you know um, David Otto? I sure do. Yes, I do. <laughs> he was the one that didn't <laughs> want me to put his horse Australian <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. Yeah, David. David. Me and David talked about this, and he was telling me about it, and then. I came up with the website, but yeah, uh, it's it's a challenge down here. It's really a challenge. People are losing interest in the state of Mississippi. It's hot down here for one thing. I mean, it's really hot and humid and don't nobody want to get out and work these horses much. They want to play on Nintendo and, and, and Game Boys. They don't want to get out. So it's 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 a challenge, but I, I really love this. I, and I'm going to have to get off here too, guys, but I really love this. I feel like I got a team now. I feel like I got somebody that thinks like I do, and I really appreciate this, Miss Sarah. Well, I'm tickled to pieces that David Otto knew about it because, and and whoever said, shared it with David, um, and uh, whoever shared, shared it with the Amish contingent that was on tonight, I am tickled to pieces about that. And you know who you are. Um, but to encourage <laughs> you, think about this: Jenny Cotton is in Mississippi, and somehow, some way, she found about this. She found out about this 15 year old stallion who I believe was in Ohio, unregistered, but eligible to be registered. And by golly, she went through the work and got that horse at 15 years registered. Now that's the person that you want me to connect you with. So there are pockets of okay. encouragement that I, can, that I can give you. You people that are on the call tonight, that's encouraging too. Um, and I sure hope that, I, I hope I didn't sound too, too salty with with Sharon in the sense that that um, 
taking out again taking out ads costs money and it, we can't look at quality based on how much people spend in, in their ads um it is a new venture for a lot of people a lot of people just today in a group talked about wanting to someone she was on the call wanted a chestnut stallion to breed her mare to and a woman commented a woman who has worked a long time for a carriage company said registered Hirschmans don't come in anything but black and gray okay and I literally said you need to take this off because you're perpetuating falsehoods there are a lot of people who only know what they know and the internet can post a lot of challenges. Um, see you later. Uh, uh, Diane, thank you for being here. Um, but it, there's, so, there's so much that we can say is encouraging from the last call, the call tonight. Um, and again, let this, let this video uh, with uh, um, Virginia on YouTube, watch that. I mean, it's gonna be up there for infinity and I apologize for the stammers, but she speaks so well. There might be some things that are not gonna carry over to North America, okay. But if this can get the, the ball rolling and, the, and the, the juices flowing about how to integrate horses, persons in your everyday life and the life of your community, it's about blooming where we're planted. It's about the ripple effect. It's about planting seeds. And you never know, it's that, there's a young man from North Dakota that said, I went through the foster care system, but somebody had an uncle that had old style Persians. And now I'm in the oil business and I got a little bit of money and I bought me a team. So you never know what seeds you're planting in somebody. You never know how, what kind of an ambassador you can be. And if I can help you, I'm happy to do so. Um, I'm a little bit sassy sometimes, but that doesn't mean that I don't care. That might mean I have a bunch of other stuff going on, but I'll sure try to do what I can do to point you in the right direction, either find the information out for you or point you in the right direction to find the information out for yourself. That goes for anybody. And, and that being said, I don't know everything. Anybody have anything else they want to say? Okay. I was sure hoping we could make this at 90 minutes, but thank you for sticking it out with us and uh, we'll try to truncate that. Where's our link site? Okay, I will send it again. Uh, it's to the YouTube channel. Uh, it's to the YouTube of my interview with Virginia. I want to say her last name is pronounced Kumu. Kum no, I'm not going to do it. Kumjin. Uh, she is a, living in La Perche in France. And she is very connected to the French breeders, but she is also very astute in following the goings on of the American, North American Persian as well. Um, she's well read, she's well spoken, and like I said, she's going to be putting in an article about the French breed in the next edition of the Draft Horse Journal. Uh, she gave a wonderful, um, just huge bucket of information post-World War II up to right now on the French person. So there's the link. Um, you can go to that anytime it's it's public so if you want to share that with other people that weren't on the call um you're more than welcome to do so there is a recording of this i will make it for the uh the link isn't showing okay um let's see if i can do this again okay so when you click on that, are you seeing it? Are you seeing the in the message chat box? Are you seeing the link? And when you click on the link, is it taking you where you need to go? Can somebody let me know, please? The no. link is not appearing in the chat at all. Oh my God. 
because I am hitting it. Okay, let me see. Um, okay. Let me try one more time. I think I, it's my screw up because it was, it was saying, uh, okay, now try it. it. Says It was says waiting room instead of to everyone. Is it showing up now? Yes. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> now, when you try to clicking on the link, is it getting you where you need to go? Thank you, Lori. Thank you for being here. Can it post to email? Yeah, I'll post it to email. I'll send it to you. Um, I might not do it tonight. Uh, but uh, can somebody tell me that came up? Thank you, Terry. It came up for Terry. So yeah, if you want to uh, copy that link, put it in your browser. It's, it's 40 minutes of Kershren Bliss. Uh, giving you an idea of what's going on over there and what, how we can in integrate things here. Um, and maybe something new and innovative that nobody's ever thought of that you come up with. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know it works. Um, with that, I'm going to bid you adieu and vive le prochain. And um, if anyone has any questions that come up that we can have in another meeting, please let me know. Please send me some feedback because I got no feedback from the last one but that's okay. Anybody? Last call? God bless you.